everybody tuning in online that can't be here in person. I'm grateful that uh, we can, the Lord has opened doors to be able to not only minister and feed the folks here, but also to be able to feed some of, the, some of God's people online that uh, are for health reasons or distance reasons or for whatever reason uh, can't be here. So we're glad, glad everybody took the time to be here and to tune in. And uh, let's go ahead and turn to Ruth, the book of Ruth in the Old Testament. Joshua judges Ruth, and uh, we'll turn to Ruth chapter 4. All right. The book of Ruth. Uh, Mark was talking this morning about the books of Esther and Song of Solomon not having the word God in the book. I knew Esther was that way. I didn't realize Song of Solomon was, and I find that interesting. Um, but the two books in the Bible named after women are Esther and Ruth. And there's an interesting, of course, the way the Lord put his, put his book together. That's not accidental. The book of Esther, like Mark was saying, uh, from a prophetic standpoint, obviously it's a historical book, it's a historical story that really happened, but the details that God has chosen to uh, include in that book give a very definite prophetic picture and a type of what's going to happen in the future with the nation of Israel and the restoration of Israel. And so Esther is a type of Israel. And what's interesting is here in the book of Ruth, you have a Jew marrying a Gentile. And what you have there is a type of Christ in the church. So Esther is a type of God the Father and the nation of Israel, if you will, and that marriage between the two, if you will. And the book of, of Ruth is a type of Jesus Christ and his marriage to the church. Uh, the church being a predominantly Gentile uh, body. And, um, you know, in Christ there's neither Jew nor Gentile, but we know in the Old Testament it was a predominantly Jewish thing that God was operating with the Jewish people, whereas in the New Testament that door of salvation is opened up to everybody. And so predominantly that uh, church is likened to a Gentile bride, and I'll get into that in just a minute. But let's look at uh, Ruth chapter 4, and we'll read verse 9. And it says, And Boaz said unto the elders and unto all the people, Ye are witnesses this day, that I have brought all that was Elim that I have bought, all that was Elimelech's, and all that was Kilion's and Malon's, of the hand of Naomi. I'm just going to say it's Malon. I don't know if that's the right pronunciation, but it's easier to say. Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of Malon, I have purchased to be my wife, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance, that the name of the dead be not cut off from among his brethren. Now, that sounds weird to us, but in those ancient times, having a family and having possessions and land is a big deal. And so if a person died without having any children, it was a, it was a responsibility in those cultural times for the brother to uh, produce children with the husband's widowed wife or with the, with the brother's widowed wife. You know, the brother dies, she doesn't have any children, so the brother was supposed to do the job of raising up children upon the name of his dead brother so those children could have that inheritance. All right, so that's kind of what's going on here. I know that's really weird in our society, but... Um, that's just how they did it back in those old days. All right. And it says, uh, and from the gate of this place, ye are witnesses this day. And all the people that were in the gate and the elders said, we are witnesses. The Lord make the woman that has come into thine house like Rachel and like Leah, which too did build the house of Israel. And do thou worthily in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem. And let thy house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bare unto Judah, of the seed which the Lord shall give thee of this young woman. So Boaz took Ruth, and she was his wife. And when he went in unto her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bare a son. Let's have one more quick word of prayer. Father, I come before you this morning. I do pray that uh, you'd edify your people and feed them this morning. Uh, and I pray, God, you fill me with your spirit and just give me the words to say. And I believe by faith you will. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, and so uh, what we have here is the culmination, essentially, of this story between Ruth and Boaz. And if you'll remember, a Jewish couple named Elimelech and Naomi, along with their two sons, Malon and Kilion, had migrated out of the land of Israel into the, com into the country of Moab due to a famine in Israel back in those days. This is the time of the judges. You know, you got Samson and, and you got... Uh, uh, oh. 
Gideon and all those judges. Well, during this time, at some point during the time of the judges of Israel, there was this story of there was a famine in, in Israel, and so Elimelech and his family, uh, Naomi and their uh, Elimelech, Naomi, Kilion, and Malon, migrated into the land of Moab to get away from the famine. And it's kind of understandable why someone would do something like that. But uh, by all indications, this move of this family was not something that God approved of. Uh, they evidently didn't pray about it. Um, they evidently didn't seek God's will over it. You remember that the condition of the time of the judges in that time period in Israel's history was every man did that which was right in his own eyes. It was just a time of pragmatism. It wasn't a time of faith. It was just, if it works, we do it. Okay, And uh, you've got to watch out for pragmatism in the Christian life. Sometimes what works isn't what's right. And you've got to make sure you're doing what's right, whether or not it comes with the results you want or not. But anyway... This family was basically just moving to Moab based on a knee-jerk reaction to a bad situation. And it's possible that had they inquired of the Lord, okay, let's theoretically surmise if this family, you know, you've got this bad situation, maybe our lives are at stake, you know, we might die in this land if we can't eat, okay, so uh, maybe if they had inquired of God, God could have told them, hey, stay put and I'll take care of you. That's a possibility. Uh, God could have told them, hey, what I want you to do is go ahead and sojourn, but sojourn to another part of Israel. That's a possibility. Or God could have even said, hey, go ahead and go sojourn in Israel, or go sojourn in Moab. Go do that. That's fine. I, that's my will. Go ahead and do that. Go sojourn in Moab. But the difference there what is, that, is that the move would have been blessed instead of cursed, since they would have sought the Lord first. I'm not saying that it's automatically wrong for them to go into the land of Moab. And the reason why I say that is because, uh, it, for example, in the birth of Jesus, remember, the Lord, God Himself, had told Joseph and Mary, you need to go to the land of Egypt for a while. You need to escape persecution. You need to go into a Gentile country and live there for a while until Herod dies. Now, I'm sure Egypt wasn't, was uh, you know, the last place that Joseph and Mary would have wanted to go to, right? Or expected to go to. They probably never thought in their lifetime they'd ever wind up in Egypt of all places. But uh, rather than being stubborn or rigid, they were flexible and they did what the Lord had told them to do. Even though it wasn't necessarily their first choice, right? So it's, it can be the will of God to go into a Gentile land like, uh, like Naomi and Elimelech could have, but the main thing is they should have sought the Lord first. The most important thing is you should always seek God's will first in all your decisions. Seek God's will first, and number two, be flexible. Because sometimes what you perceive, this has got to be the will of God, maybe the exact opposite is God's will. And you need to be flexible as a Christian because sometimes the will of God will put you in places you never expected. And so the problem was Elimelech was being pragmatic and just did what seemed best to him regardless of what the Lord's will was. And so they moved to Moab. And while there, his sons married what's called strange women in the Bible. They married two strange women. And Elimelech ended up dying, and that was Naomi's husband. And the two boys, Malon and Kilion, ended up dying. And that left you with Naomi. Orpah and Ruth, right? The three women out there on their own. So there was a lot of uh, trouble and sorrow that came about because of this move. And you know what? Had this family trusted in the Lord with all their heart and leaned not unto their own understanding, this disaster could have been averted. But that's always what happens when you walk according to the flesh and not according to the Spirit. Whenever you're relying upon your own wisdom and your own ways and trusting in yourself, it'll always end in a disaster. It can't end any other way because that's the end of the flesh. It's death, destruction, sin, disaster. It always goes that way. And uh, God is life. And so when you follow the Spirit, when you walk uh, according to God's ways, it's going to lead to paths of light and life and righteousness and blessing. Okay. So Naomi's reflection on this time period is summed up in chapter 1, if you look there real quick. I'm going to try to give you something for your heart and your head this morning. So if you don't, have, if you don't like the heart portion, maybe you'll like the head portion. And if you're one of those people that I don't really care about the information, I want to actually get something for my heart, well, I've got a little bit of both for you this morning. All right, chapter 1, verse 19, it says, So they too went until they came to Bethlehem. This is uh, Ruth and Naomi going back. 
all right, after the death of all these people. And it came to pass, when they were come to Bethlehem, that all the city was moved about them. And they said, Is this Naomi? And she said unto them, Call me not Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. Look at verse 21. She says, I went out full. Wait a second, I thought there was a famine. It's amazing how your perspective can change after you've really seen that the grass is not greener on the other side. She said, I went out full. They had more than they realized. And it says, and, uh, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Why then call ye me Naomi, seeing the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me? All right, so she talks about this time period in Moab, and she calls it a time of affliction and a time of bitterness. And you'll never guess how long they were gone for. Does anybody want to take a guess? Look at verse 4. <laughs> Look at verse 4. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other Ruth. And they dwelled there about ten years. Boom. <laughs> so the reason why I point that out is because that ten-year thing, I've, I've uh, emphasized this for some time, but that's significant because the length of the tribulation period from the rapture, to the, the rapture of the church to the second advent of Jesus Christ, I teach, is ten years. Seven years of beginning of sorrows, three and a half years of great tribulation, not three and a half years of peace, three and a half years of tribulation for a seven-year time period. I don't believe that. I believe it's a 10-year time period. You got it again right there in type. All right? Interesting. But that's just anecdotal evidence, okay? <laughs> so, <laughs> so you know the rest of the story, all right? Ruth and Boaz fall in love, and they end up getting uh, married, and all of the legal, legal complications of Boaz being a Jew and Ruth being a Gentile all work out perfectly, because under normal circumstances, God doesn't want the Jew marrying the Gentile. All right? So that's a problem. But God worked things out out in, these, uh, in this interesting situation. And it always amazes me how the Lord can bring about a perfect solution for an impossible situation. And so if you're ever in a situation in your life where it just seems like something's impossible, never forget that God is more than capable of doing the impossible. Anytime. And he's done it many times. And so in, it says there in Ruth 4.13 that Boaz took Ruth and she was his wife. And look what it says here. And when he went in unto her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bare a son. Now, I find that a little bit of an interesting phrase. Because regardless of what modern science says, conception is not simply a biological process that functions automatically. Um, I'm still old enough, old-fashioned enough to believe that God is the one that gives conception in every case. And people can try to have a kid all they want, but if God says no and shuts the womb, there is no biological process in this universe that's going to create a life. It's just not going to happen. God is still the one that creates children. All children. All right? God told Jeremiah, I formed thee in the belly. In Jeremiah 1.5. And the same is true of you. You are a creation of God, not your parents. Okay? Your mother is simply the factory that God built you in. Your mother didn't create you. God created you. If you're here and breathing this morning and you're not an alien, God created you. <laughs> okay. Now, uh, it says the Lord gave her conception. Why would the Lord write it that way? I like to ask these kinds of questions. Like, that's not how God normally writes it. Why would God not say, and Boaz knew Ruth and she conceived and bare a child? That's how it's normally written in the Bible. Why does it say God gave her conception? The phrase, I think, carries a subtle connotation that prior to this... The Lord didn't give Ruth conception. Why didn't Ruth already have a baby with Mala, Malon? They were young people. She and Malon were young and married. Why didn't they have any kids? Why didn't Naomi come into the land of Israel with Ruth and a couple little grandchildren? It's interesting. There could be a few reasons, but the wording here seems to imply to me that Ruth was not able to conceive. Which would make sense because Malon, as a Jew, was not supposed to marry a Moabite Gentile, and God was not blessing that family for their disobedience. It's very possible. Psalms 127.3 says, Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is His reward. So if you do things wrong, especially in the Old Testament, God's not obligated to bless you with children. And the Lord could have chosen not to reward Malon and Ruth with a child because of Malon's sin. There's no indication that Orpah had children either with uh, Kilion. All right? So the indication is that Ruth may have been a barren woman. 
All right? And, uh, you know, Boaz, he, you say, well, what about Boaz? He's marrying a Gentile woman. Isn't that wrong? Well, uh, like I said, he was fulfilling a legal requirement of raising up the name of, his dead, uh, of the dead upon their inheritance. And so essentially what's happening here is Boaz found a loophole in God's law. He was able to legally marry Ruth without breaking any, without sinning, even though she was a Gentile. It's kind of interesting. There's a little legal loophole there. He was able to kind of get around a couple things and marry this woman that he loved. And, it, and God blessed it. All right? And so, the, so I'm wondering here, because it says the Lord gave her conception, it makes me wonder if the Lord had not given her conception prior to this, and she may have been barren. Now, I might be reading too much into this, but let me just hear me out for a second. The other reason why I think that this is the case is because this would fit perfectly with another pattern that we find in the Bible. And God does things in sevens throughout the Bible. I don't know if you've noticed that, but God does things in sevens throughout the Bible. And over the years of reading this Bible for over two decades and studying it, I've noticed that when God does things in sevens, it's very frequent that He'll do six very clearly, and the seventh is a hidden thing. Or it's not clearly seen, or it's mysterious in some way. I've noticed that. Uh, for example, there are six Jewish national holidays as given in the law. Uh, Passover, Unleavened Bread, First Fruits, Trumpets, Day of Atonement, Feast of Tabernacles. The Lord gives six. So is He going to leave you hanging there? The, the Jubilee is not a, not a, a, a feast. All right? So is He going to leave you there? Well, what ends up coming later is Purim. The Feast of Purim becomes the next uh, annual national holiday for the nation of Israel. But you don't get that until the book of Esther, which interestingly enough means uh, hidden, hidden, hidden one, hidden things. All right, so it's interesting. Um, there are seven specific prophetesses in the Bible. If you look at the word prophetesses uh, or prophetess, there's six of them. Uh, six of them are named, or I should put it this way. Six of them are, give, are given by name, and the seventh is not named. There's only there's seven, but one of them's not named. There's Miriam, Deborah, Huldah, Noadiah, Anna, and Jezebel in Revelation 2. And the seventh that's not named is Isaiah's wife. I just find that interesting. I don't know what you're going to do that. I don't know how that's going to help you at work tomorrow, but uh, <laughs> I find it interesting. All right, the scriptures are inspired in seven major, given by inspiration in seven major languages, and the seventh is somewhat mysterious, but I'll leave that to you to ponder and figure out for yourself. All right, so anyway, keep this concept of God doing things in sevens tucked away in the back of your mind because you will see that pop up all throughout the Bible. And in this instance, according to the Bible, there are clearly seven, uh, or there are clearly six barren women in the Bible. Let's think of some of the barren women. Who do you remember? You remember Sarah was barren for a long time, right? She was a barren woman. Then you had uh, Rebecca. Remember, if you look these stories up, Jacob's wife, she was barren for quite a while. Uh, you have um, Rachel. Oh, I'm sorry, Rachel married uh, Isaac. Rebe or, Rachel married Jacob, Rebecca married Isaac, but both, all of them were, uh, were uh, barren. That's kind of unlucky. <laughs> Abraham Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, they're all barren. But God uh, blessed them with a, with a child uh, at some point. The Bible says they were barren. All right, then you have Hannah. Can anybody else think of a, a barren woman in the Bible off the top of their heads? So I don't just give them all to you. Elizabeth's one of them. Yep. Anybody else can you think of? The Bible, uh, if you look up the word barren, you find it. Uh, these times, these, these people mentioned clearly in the Bible. One of them was Manoah's wife, which was Samson's mom. And you're not told what her name is. All right, so you have six. And I know the Lord, just knowing God, He's not going to leave you hanging with six. There's always going to be a seventh, and a lot of times that seventh is hard to find. And so I cannot prove conclusively from the Bible that Ruth was barren. But knowing how God does things, knowing how this book is written, knowing that a lot of times the type of the bride of God, of, of the bride of Christ, the nation of Israel, those types, there's always this barrenness associated with it, it seems like. And so it wouldn't surprise me at all if Ruth is that seventh hidden barren woman given in the Bible. Like I say, I can't necessarily prove that, but it's a pattern that fits. All right, so anyway, the Lord did give a child to Ruth and Boaz. And not only was their ability to get married complicated because of the law, but their ability to have children may have even been complicated. You know, don't forget, even if Ruth wasn't barren, you say, well, I don't believe that. I don't think that's the case. I think you're reading too much into it. Okay, fine. But, but Boaz was an older man. 
All right? So that's, that's maybe a little bit troublesome. But God worked all the situations out. Psalms 113.9 says, He maketh the barren woman to keep house and to be a joyful mother of children. Praise ye the Lord. And what I want to focus on this morning is this blessing here that's bestowed upon Boaz and Ruth. In verse 11, it says, The Lord make the woman that is come into thine house, like Rachel and like Leah, which two did build the house of Israel. And do thou worthily in Ephratah, and be thou famous in Bethlehem. Now it says that uh, Rachel and Leah did build the house of Israel. And Israel was the name of the husband. Jacob, you know, his name was Jacob, and then the angel changed it to Israel. So, you know, we're not talking about the nation of Israel per se. We're talking about a man who had two wives. And uh, Rachel and Leah were, were Israel's wives, and they built his house. Um, that doesn't mean that the two women put on the tool bags, you know, and got their speed square and their hammer and their tape measure and went and built a house while Jacob, you know, and it just sat there with the Dr. Pepper watching them build the house. That's not what that's talking about. Uh, these two women built the house of Israel by bearing him children. Okay? That's what it means by built the house. As in built the household. That's how women build houses is by having children. Men build houses literally. Women build houses figuratively, if you will. Uh, men build houses with their hands. Women build houses with their wombs, if you will. House in the Bible can often be referred to as a household, okay? And so Rachel and Leah built up the household of Jacob by having a bunch of kids. And if I was to talk about the house or the household, let's say, of Mark Peden, I could be referring to the actual building that he lives in, or I could be referring to his family. Okay, so that's, that's how that works. I think everybody kind of gets that. It's sort of basic. All right, so a woman can build a house by having children. The Bible says in Proverbs 14, 1, Every wise woman buildeth her house. Right? And in general, godly wise women, you know, uh, want to have children. They do. In general, godly wise women do want to have children. That's natural. Of course, there are women that can't have children, you know, for biological reasons. And there are also women who remain unmarried and care for the things of the Lord, that they may be holy both in body and spirit. Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians 7. That's fine. If a woman didn't want to get married but just wanted to be devoted to the Lord, that's fine. But that's an exception to the general rule. We all know that the general rule is that uh, the desire of women is to have children. That is the desire of women. And after the fall, God had told Eve, remember this? In uh, Genesis chapter 3, after the fall, God had told Eve that he was going to give her desire to her husband. Remember that? Does everybody remember that? Not really? Let's look at Genesis chapter 3 real quick. Let's look at the wording here. Genesis chapter 3. The desire of women is not a woman head over heels for her husband. I've noticed that. <laughs> like Men seem to be definitely attracted to women. Women, yeah, they're attracted to men, but what they're interested in, in is kids. <laughs> they want to have kids. They love kids. The desire of women is children. All right? Women tend to love children men, more than men love children. My wife was all about having kids. I was not so much about having kids at the time. But uh, Genesis chapter 3, I love kids, but not as much as my wife does. All right, Genesis 3.15, it says, I will put in between, between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. So you read that, and you think, oh, well, that means that her desire, is, she's going to desire her husband. And uh, that's an interesting, you know, I can see how you might think that. It's, that's what you might assume just reading it. But you, you, you look at it a little bit closer and you think about it throughout the Bible. Um, the desire of women is children. And it, in other words, given that understanding, you read that passage and it seems to imply that prior to the fall that desire for children was not given to her husband. Because you're, cause also before the fall, she didn't conceive children in pain and sorrow, right? Or she wouldn't have if, she had lived long, if they had been there long enough to have children, okay? So it seems to imply that before the fall, her desire was not to her, her husband. That was something that happened after the fall. So like I said, this is just stuff for your head to think about. I find it sort of interesting. It seems to imply that uh, before the fall, Eve may have been capable of conceiving without a man if she wanted to, anytime she wanted to. As the human woman was built that way by God, you, you could potentially have a child anytime you wanted. 
I don't know if that's the case, but it says that after the fall, the, the desire, that desire for children was given to the husband. He held it. It wasn't hers anymore. It makes you wonder if before the fall, she may have been capable of a virgin birth. Now think about that. It's an interesting thought. Ladies, uh, if you could have a, if you lived in a perfect environment, okay, and you were young all the time and you never aged, and uh, you, you, if you could have a baby any time you wanted, okay, and you could stay young and healthy and you wouldn't be laden with the cares of this life and you wouldn't have a bunch of bills and medical bills and electrical bills and everything was easy and you wouldn't have to worry about your kids, you know, running out and getting hit by a car on the road and you can simply have kids for your own personal enjoyment, is that something that you'd be interested in? And you wouldn't have to worry about, you know, your husband not helping with all the kids. Well, I wouldn't want to do that because I have too many kids. I wouldn't get any help, and I'd just be pulling my hair out. Um, I'm just saying in a perfect environment, that might be something a, a woman might be interested in. And that might be the way that God built it originally. I don't know. It's an interesting thought. Uh, children are to the desire of women. In the, in the tribulation, the Antichrist, the Bible says, will not regard the desire of women. Okay? Some people make that out to mean that he's going to be some kind of uh, sodomite. And he's not going to like women. I don't, I don't believe that's what that's saying. I, don't, I believe he's not going to regard the desire of women, like Jesus said, woe unto them that give suck in those days. Why? Because the Antichrist is going to kill your babies, like Herod did, and like Pharaoh did. He's not going to spare the infants or the children. He's going to murder them. The Antichrist is not going to regard the desire of women. And so I think that that's what that's talking about. But anyway, like I said, that's just food for thought. You can just take that or leave that. You don't have to agree with me. Like I said, I'm not teaching doctrine there. I just think, oh, it's, it's interesting. What does that mean that her desire was given to her husband? It implies that it wasn't given to her, her husband before that. Mm, interesting. All right, so anyway, a wise woman buildeth her house. Generally speaking, a wise woman buildeth her house. In general, there is something off about women who don't want to have kids. And something is usually not right in the head or not right in the heart with a woman who doesn't like children or doesn't want to have kids. And uh, why, is that, why is it that conservative women who regard morality, I'm not even talking about saved women, I'm just talking about conservative women that have a, some kind of a moral standard in life, why is it that often they're happy mothers of children? And uh, why is it that liberal women who march in Washington, D.C. with lewd hats on their head are often immoral and hate children? Why is that? Why is it that immoral women hate children and they can't stand children? You don't have to have a Ph.D. to notice those kinds of things. The ways of sinfulness are foolish ways, right? And the ways of righteousness are wise ways. And so, consequently, morally upright people tend to have children. Because the Bible says a wise woman buildeth her house. It just comes natural. They tend to live happier, more fulfilled lives. But the Bible says in Proverbs, the wise woman buildeth her house, but the foolish plucketh it down with her hands. A foolish woman will pluck down her house. She'll pluck down her children, her household, her generations. And it's interesting that that's exactly what takes place in an abortion. The Bible is a very uh, profound book. That's exactly how an abortion works. The foolish woman plucketh her household down. That's how it works, and that's what the Bible calls unnatural affection. And anytime you're dealing with something unnatural, okay, abortion is unnatural. It's unnatural affection. It's not women, the desire of women is children, and it's unnatural. You don't even have to be saved. It has nothing to do with salvation. It's just not in your wiring to want to destroy the child in your womb. That is an unnatural, unnatural affection, right? And so when you're dealing with something that's unnatural, you're always dealing with demons, okay? Demons. Women who get abortions are demon-possessed. And I don't apologize for saying that for one second, because that's the truth. It doesn't mean that their head is spinning around and they got a white face and their hair is everywhere. I'm not talking about that demon possession. I'm talking about the reason why they did something that makes no sense to their natural body is they have an external influence trying to get them to do something that they otherwise normally wouldn't do. That's demon possession or demon oppression, whatever you want to call it. Regardless, any time an abortion takes place, I promise you, I, don't, I, I promise you, a, a demon was involved in that thing. I got a woman to think that way. Because they don't naturally think that way. And if someone listening to me is feeling terrible because maybe they've had an abortion, just know that you know, what you did was greatly due to the influence of a demon in your life. And don't live defeated simply because a demon got you to do something bad. Okay? You need to repent of it. 
You need to recognize that you are manipulated by a demon. You need to reject that demonic influence in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you haven't already. And you need to rise and do something for Jesus Christ and redeem the time. Okay? Go on for, with your life. You can be born again of, and, and saved and, and a Christian and have had an abortion. That doesn't mean that God has cast you off. You just were influenced by a demon. Christians can be influenced by a demon to do lots of things. <laughs> and abortion is just one more thing that a demon can influence a Christian woman to do. Don't live a defeated life over that. Rise up and redeem the time. Rachel and Leah did uh, build the house of Israel. Now, for many years I worked construction, and I've built many houses. And one of the things I've noticed that when it comes to building a house is that you need to start with a foundation. That's pretty basic, right? Uh, you can't, you can, uh, if you wanted to, you could slap some floor joists on the dirt and deck your floor joists and start building up some walls, you know, but uh, you need to have a foundation established before you build the house because if you build a house that way, it's not going to last. You got to have a foundation first. And if children are the building of the house, remember she said, uh, did build the house? If uh, building up the house here is likened to having children, then what do you think this foundation is a type of? It's going to be a type of the marriage. It's going to be a type of the marriage, the foundation. All right? If children are the building of the house, then marriage is the foundation. And you would think that it would go without saying, but how many women these days start building walls with no foundation? So many women start building their walls while they're still in high school. They start having children and building up the house before they've even got a foundation, right? You can actually, you actually can, actually, believe it or not, you can uh, build a house with no foundation and then insert a foundation later. I know that's weird. It's a really backwards way of building a house. But you can actually have walls and then dig underneath the house and jack it up and pour some concrete slab and put a foundation in, in after the fact. It can be done. But, uh, you know, it's very difficult to do it that way. <laughs> it's a very backwards way of doing things. And the fact of the matter is, when you try to do things that way and try to put a, a foundation after the fact, it ends up breaking a lot of things in here a lot of times. It ends up damaging a lot of the walls and a lot of the floors and the stories of the house. Um, that's just the fact of the matter. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5. The proper Bible order, as given here, 1 Timothy chapter 5, is this. Verse 14. Paul says, I will therefore that the younger women marry, number one. Number two, bear children. Number three, guide the house. Okay, and otherwise, 99 out of 100 times, if a woman doesn't do it this way, what happens is it will give occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully of her. If you get out of God's order, something's going to get messed up. You're better off just doing things God's way. You don't want to be bearing children and then getting married. <laughs> if you can help, that's not the right way. That's going to give occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. You understand? So do it this way, and it'll give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. All right? Now, listen. The world says that a woman is brave and fearless. A woman who uh, avoids having children at all costs, you know, and pursues a career and uh, only keeps the man around for their own personal benefit. Uh, the fact of the matter is that woman is not brave. That woman is a fool. That woman is a loser and is making a mess out of her life. The woman that doesn't want to do things God's way. That's not brave, and that's not fearless. That's stupid. And uh, the Bible way is to start by finding the right husband and getting married, generally speaking. I'm not saying that every Christian woman has to get married, and you can't get a job. The first thing you have to do when you turn 18 is get married. You can't go to school. I'm not saying all that. But you want to make sure that you're putting in a, 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 a premium on the Word of God. It's fine for young women to be able to work and to know how to work and be able to get an education. I'm, all that stuff's fine. The virtuous woman is not some dunce sitting at home that doesn't know how to do anything. She's a very smart woman, okay? Nothing wrong with that. She's a hard worker. But this idea, this modern liberal idea that the, that the highest elevation for a woman is to be above a man, whether it be in politics, whether it be in uh, business, you know, your goal in life is to be the boss so you can tell the men what to do. 
That's a woman trying to get around God's thing there in Genesis chapter 3. So the man's going to rule over the woman. You know, and so all these women, they want to try to, they rebel against God. Anything I can do to be number one. That mentality is wrong. You want to watch out for that, because that is a mentality that is very uh, prevalent in this backward society that we're living in. All right? So, uh, number two, so you not only need to start with a foundation, that's obvious, but number two, you need to have a strong foundation. And uh, listen, uh, foundations don't magically lay themselves, <laughs> okay? Uh, I build houses, I know. And uh, laying a, a, a strong foundation is a lot of work. And uh, building the walls, you know, that's a lot of fun, actually. If you've ever done construction, building walls is the fun part. You know, you get the nail gun, you just, you know, start going really fast, you raise up the walls, you know, doing all this fun stuff. That's the fun part. The foundation, that can be a pain in the neck sometimes, <laughs> you know. Uh, it's always exciting, okay, when you first get started, you know, because you got the blueprints laid out on the table. They're all fresh, you know. You let your tape measure kind of keep the pages from rolling up, and you're just looking at this thing, and you're looking at this blank plot of land, and you're just thinking, man, this house is going to be awesome. You know, you imagine that this house that we're going to build is going to be the best house on the block, and uh, it's going to be exceeding magnificent, like the Bible says. And uh, you start digging the hole, you know, you got all these ambitions and these plans and we're going to be done in three months and we're going to move in and all this and so you start and you end up digging the hole and then you find out man the ground is a little bit harder than i expected you know and uh, then you think oh man these concrete bags they're heavy and then you know you're pouring the concrete bags into the concrete mixer and the dust is flying up in your face getting in your nostrils and you're wondering if uh, having uh, concrete cement in your lungs is going to be bad for you in the future if i'm going to get cancer you know you start uh you slice your hand as you're trying to pound in the rebar you know rain starts falling makes everything a muddy mess and you know what you thought was going to be exceeding magnifical ends up just being exceeding fecal you know and that's about it and uh, that takes the mag off of it <laughs> and uh, every everyone has tough times that's, that can describe marriage sometimes okay the foundation the building of that thing everybody has tough times but you can get through it and uh, everything uh, might not be going according to your blueprint that you started with when you first got married but don't give up and keep making that foundation strong and uh, the way you make things strong is by pressure by heat, by resistance. That's what makes things strong. And in the first 10 years, you know, of me and Ashley's marriage, there was some real pressure, heat, and resistance at times. I look at pictures of us on our wedding day, and I think, what were my parents thinking? <laughs> it's really not their fault. But man, we looked like little babies when we got married. And, uh, you know, we, we struggled financially when we first started. You know, we signed up for some stupid things. We got suckered into a timeshare. And, uh, you know, remember the blueprint? You know, we saw this timeshare aspect, and we were still at the blueprint stage, and we were like, man, let's get a timeshare. You know, we'll be able to go on vacation once a year, travel all over the world. It'll be awesome. You know, that we're still looking at a blueprint. But then you actually start living life and building that foundation and building the house and you find out, man, this uh, timeshare was a bad idea. We didn't end up using it one time and we sunk thousands of dollars into that thing until the Lord mercifully got that yoke off our necks. But uh, early in those days of marriage, you know, we had some good times, absolutely, but we also had some pretty epic fights, you know, and I'm sure you did too. Uh, we were both learning how not to be selfish because when you're young and you're single, you naturally think about number one. But now you have number two with you and so you got to, you know, you got both of you, and so you can't be selfish anymore. We were learning how not to be selfish. I was learning as a young man how to provide for a household, which I never had to do before, just always just me. I had to learn how to provide for a household. My wife had to learn how to cook, and we both made a lot of mistakes, <laughs> you know. You know, but uh, we learned. You know, I made, let me just say, I made a lot of mistakes as a young husband. And I wish that I could get in the time machine and go back and slap myself and say, what are you thinking? You know, quit being so stupid. But, uh, you, you know, you can't do that. You just have to try to learn and try to do your best. And, and uh, you know, those mistakes and the heat of those arguments, you know, and the cooling down process of apologizing afterwards. That's how you, that's how you hammer out a sword. You know, you get it really hot, stick it in the water. Cool it down. Thing gets hot again, pound it on that thing, and then you got to cool it down again. That strengthens the sword. It's a heat process and a cooling process, you know, and you have some hot fights sometimes, but you got to cool down and you got to apologize 
and get some things right between the two of you before you go forward. Tempered, uh, we, we tempered the steel of our foundation with those things. And it solidified the concrete of our marriage. And it's important that you get that foundation strong before you start having kids. Because number three, you're going to need a foundation that can withstand the weight of the walls. You're going to need a marriage that can withstand the weight of having children. Because walls are heavy and children are expensive. And I'm glad that I had children when we did, honestly. Um, I'm glad that we had our kids earlier on in our marriage. Uh, because if it had been up to me, I'd probably still not have any kids right now. <laughs> you know, Just my natural tendency. My desire is not for children. Okay, My desire is to my wife. Her desire was to children. But it's a perfect balance that God has built into the marriage. And um, you know, I saw kids. When I thought of kids, I thought of additional responsibility and more bills. That's, that's just what I thought. I know that's maybe not the right way to look at it. But that's just my, as a responsible human being that has to provide for these extra mouths, you know, and sometimes we're make, you're just barely making ends meet with just the two of us. Why are we thinking about adding a third person to this family? <laughs> you know, and uh, so I was interested, you know, at the time I was a young kid. I was more interested in having fun than having kids. But looking back, I'm glad that we had kids when we did. Um, it's not a sin or anything to uh, wait longer. But throughout the Bible, look at Proverbs chapter 5. The ideal pattern, as given in the Bible, again, this is not a hard, fast commandment, but this is a general, general wise instruction. Okay? Proverbs chapter 5, look at the ideal situation as to when to have kids. Proverbs chapter 5, look at verse 15. He says, drink waters out of thine own cistern. Okay, now this isn't talking about a literal well that you're drinking your own water out of and have filtered tap water. It's not, there's an allegory here, okay? And he's saying, drink waters out of thine own cistern and running waters out of thine own well. Okay, the fountain or the cistern or the well in the passage is going to be the wife. Okay, it says, let thy fountains, plural, be dispersed abroad in rivers, plural, of waters in the streets. So the fountains and the rivers of waters there are little children, little boys and little girls. Okay, and then in verse 17, it says, let them, the fountains and the rivers of waters, the children, let them be only thine own and not strangers with thee. That's just good advice. Try not to have, if, if any, you know, it's just good advice. I know it's hard in the modern society that we live in, but it's best to have a singular family with one marriage, with children from that one marriage. Because when you start bringing children from this uh, divorce marriage and children from this divorce marriage under one roof, it just creates additional trouble in the flesh. The Bible says marriage is going to come with trouble in the flesh, just period, as it is. But when you start adding those extra dynamics of children from previous marriages, it just really complicates a lot of things. And it's not to say that it's wrong, and it's not to say that a Christian can't marry somebody that already has kids from another marriage. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying that it, the ideal way of the ideal pattern is given right here. He says, Let thy fountain be blessed, and rejoice with the wife of thy what? Youth. A young wife, a young man, and a young woman having children, verse 17 and 16. That's the ideal pattern. That's the ideal situation. And so when you start building your house, let me also say this about the house. This is just some basic things. You need to pay attention to the details all the way to the end. Okay? Parents with five, six, seven, and eight stories on their house. Okay, I'm going to liken each story to an additional kid. This house has three children. All right? Households that have six, seven, and eight stories on their house tend to be very thorough on star story number one, story number two, maybe story number three. But by the time you get to story number seven or eight or nine, you're just settling for an unfinished attic. <laughs> you know, <laughs> not putting any drywall on those things, you know. You know <laughs> no insulation, it's just an attic. And uh, listen, as a Christian, you need to be wise about how many children you have. Uh, controlling how many children you have is not a lack of faith. Controlling how many children you have, I'm sorry, it is not a moral issue and it is not a sin to control how many children you have. Now, you can disagree with me on that if you want, but we will disagree. <laughs> and we, we will be friends, but we will not agree on that. We will agree to disagree on that. I do not believe that it is a moral issue to control how many children you have. All right? I know there are Christian families that say that if you, you can't do that, you know, and it's this religious pressure that's put on young Christian couples that says, you know, it's the will of God that you're supposed to have as many kids as God provides, and you're not to take any steps of control over that. Well, listen, the Bible does say in uh, Psalms 127.4, 
As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Blessed is, happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. You know, and they say, see, you need to have 19 kids and counting. That's the Christian way. <laughs> you need to have a full quiver. Think of all those arrows you can shoot. But the fact of the matter is, a full quiver is going to be different for everybody. If your quiver can only handle two arrows, and you try to cram five, six, or seven arrows into a two-arrow quiver, you're going to damage every single one of your arrows. All right? They're not going to fly straight, because they're going to be bent out of shape for having to be crammed in with a bunch of other arrows for 18 years. And as soon as they come of age, and you shoot that arrow out, that arrow is going to go in any direction except the direction that you want for that kid. Because he's all bent out of shape. God gave you a quiver, but He gave you a brain too. Okay? Don't have more kids that are right for you. And some Christian circles really do seriously need to hear that. <laughs> Listen, you're responsible for every single kid you have. Do not slack off at the end. If you had a kid, listen, Christian, if you have a kid, I don't care, I've got four, the Pedans have two, you guys have four, it doesn't matter how many kids you have, um, however many kids anybody has, you are responsible to follow through with all of your children. Not just the first and second and then just kind of kick back, kick it in neutral for the third and fourth and fifth or whatever. Listen, I'm sure it gets tiresome. And I'm sure the older you get, it gets more and more wearisome. And I'm sure it's a lot harder as you get older. You don't have the energy that you had when you were, had the first kids. But listen, you signed on to having every single one of your kids. And you, and you and your wife both need to have the character to finish the job you started. And that's why I don't, I don't think this idea of just having eight kids, one popping out right after the other, you know, oh, praise God. Because by the time 18 years goes by, or 20 years, or 25 years of raising children, man, most of the time, those families, those last kids, they're not even being parented by the time they get 16, 17, 18 years old. Why? Because the parents are worn out. They're tired of being parents. And they've given up. It shouldn't be that way, but a lot of times it is. Now let me finally point out something to the oldest kids. Okay? There's more weight on you than on the other siblings, okay? There's going to be more weight on you than on the other siblings. Uh, you're the bottom, bottom story because you're the firstborn. The firstborn is story number one, okay? You didn't choose that, but the fact of the matter is there is more weight on the firstborn than on the other stories, that's just the way it goes. In the Old Testament, there was an advantage to being the firstborn. Because you also got the uh, right of the inheritance. But here in the New Testament, American society, it, you, it doesn't pay to be the firstborn. <laughs> you don't get any special inheritance. You're just, you just get a lot of the pressure. You know, your parents are trying to raise you. You're the first kid, so your parents make all the mistakes with you. You know, and that's just, that's just the way it goes. But let me say this to the firstborn. God made you the firstborn. He did that on purpose. Remember, God is the one that created you. He could have made you number three or number four, but He made you as number one. He wanted you to be the first. God created you, and He created your siblings. God put you and your siblings in the order that He wanted. And if you're the firstborn, it's because God wanted you to be the firstborn and not one of your other siblings. He wanted you to be the firstborn. He and she chose to entrust that responsibility to you. And remember, God doesn't make mistakes. He did that on purpose. And so you should thank God if you're the firstborn. And you need to be the brother or sister that God wants you to be. And I get it. I get it. Sometimes it seems like the baby of the family, you know, they get it so easy. There's like no pressure up here. They just get to sit on top of everything and enjoy the view. <laughs> I get it. And, you know, like I said, parents make mistakes with the firstborn and they're doing things different with story number two and three and four. You're like, why are you doing it that way? That's not how you did it with me. There's a reason. There's a reason. Because they might have done it wrong the first time. <laughs> so they're trying to do it the right way. Now understand, you know, your parents aren't perfect. I know kids tend to think their parents are perfect, and then there's this great disappointment when they get older in life and realize, oh, they're not perfect. 
And uh, when you get older and start having families and kids, you're going to realize that your parents uh, actually knew more than you thought they did. Um, but understand that your parents aren't perfect, but you know what? They love you and they're doing their best. And, uh, rem and rather than blaming them for all your issues, okay, be a strong unit that your other siblings can depend on. Okay? Be an example of strength and righteousness to your siblings. Whether you're the first or whether you're the second or third, anybody below you or above you or whatever, be an example to them. Be a leader to them. Be someone that they can look to and count on. Because if the first four, if the first story, the firstborn will do that, chances are the second, third, and fourth, and fifth, and so on stories uh, will, will do the same thing. And if the first floor gets out of shape, you know what happens? The upper stories tend to get out of shape also. If these walls are crooked, you know, and start leaning one way, these other walls are going to experience that too. And this wall, this story could be perfect, could be doing a good job, could be straight upright. But if this story, the second, starts going wobbly one way or the other, what's going to happen? It might not affect the, the firstborn so much, but it'll affect the stories above it. So it's important that regardless of whether you're the first kid, the second kid, the third kid, the fourth kid, the fifth kid, whatever, it's important for the sake of your siblings that are younger than you that you be an example to them. All right? Now, conclusion. The Bible says that Rachel and Leah did build the house of Israel. And the Bible says in Hebrews 3.3 3, that he who hath builded the house hath more honor than the house. And if you will look well to the ways of your household, wife, and raise your children to love God and to love the Bible and to love God's people and to love God's word and to love righteousness, your house will be an honorable house. Yes. But... He or she who hath built the house hath more honor than the house itself. Okay? Rachel and Leah did build the house. They were the house builders. And you wives, you are the house builders. And you will have more honor than your house. Like it says in Proverbs, you know what? The godly woman, the virtuous woman, her children arise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praiseth her. And a woman who builds her house properly is worthy of praise and will be praised. You say, according to who? That doesn't sound right. Only God's worthy of praise. I get that. But get, who wrote that? The Holy Spirit. She says she's worthy of praise. Her husband, children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praiseth her. You'll be worthy of that respect. You'll be worthy of that praise if you do it right. And so the, the, uh, Rachel and Leah did build the house of Israel, and he who hath built the house hath more honor than a house. I hope that uh, you learned something. I hope that uh, this gave you some understanding in the Scriptures, gave you something to think about. And uh, let's close in a word of prayer. Father, I come before you this morning. Thank you, God, for giving us the Scriptures. Thank you, God, for your Word, and thank you, God, for uh, your people. And, Lord, we're all trying to do our best to build the house that you've given us. And, God, we're trying to do our best with the responsibilities that we have. Help us, Lord, not to... Help us be careful about the influences that we let into our house. Help us, Father, be careful and keep out the termites and uh, keep some of these windows closed and these doors closed, God, and have proper locks on our houses, Father, Lord, to defend against sin and wickedness. And, Father, I pray that you'd help these children, God, to uh, be strong... Uh, 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 stories or parts of the house, Lord. I know that, Father, sometimes it's easy to just defer everything to mom and dad, but God, these children have a responsibility, God, to be righteous with you also. And Father, help them, God, to uh, be examples to their brothers and sisters and be good Christians. Help us to be good, uh, clean houses, God, in the neighborhood, in our, in our communities that we live, and to be good examples of how a uh, family is supposed to operate and supposed to be. Help us, God, to love one another within our own families and, God, try to be a blessing to each other and, and uh, not be plucking each other down and critiquing each other and always uh, trying to uh, up be, on, be uh, in higher than the others. But God, help us, Lord, to love each other, to love each other better than ourselves, and to be a good example. And we love you, God, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you are dismissed.